Verse number one, come on back. You remember Paul beforehand, right? He was this egotistical dude who wanted to take all the Christians and throw them in jail. He has a Damascus Road experience with Christ, and now something changed. His whole vision changed. Watch this. Looking back at Paul's Damascus Road experience, now he places himself in sole authority under God. What does he call himself? He calls himself a bond servant. What is a bond servant? Pastor's got a tattoo on his arm. What's that all about? It's for me, it is a reminder. Who loves Christu? Bond servant of Christ. What that is a reminder for me is who I've been called to be. I have been called to be a bond servant. Guess what? We all have been called to be a bond servant of Christ. I don't want to be. Now understand what a bond servant is. A bond servant is one who gives themselves up for the will of another. A bond, yes, sir. Willingly. Willingly. That's the whole key to this. So what Paul is saying is, I had a life beforehand. It was a good life. I was the big man on campus. Everybody looked at me and said, ooh, Paul. Other believers were talking about him. Don't you know Paul? He's the one that throws everybody in prison. We don't like that dude. You want me to do what? You want me to go where? But now Paul says, I don't have any authority of my own. My authority resides in who I serve. Ready? This is the place that God longs for each and every one of us to be. Not living under our own determinations of what is right and wrong. This is the failure of the Garden of Eden. Listen to me. Come back to Genesis chapter 3 for me. When we come back to the Garden of Eden, what tree did Adam and Eve eat of? The tree of the knowledge of? Now, from that point forward, them and everybody else afterwards knew the difference between good and evil. What does that mean? That means I'm able to decide for myself what's right and what's wrong. Hey, I can have X amount of beers because I know I won't get drunk, right? What does the Bible say? I can't talk about this person behind their back because they talk about me. That's right in my mind. You know what the Bible says, woe to those who call good evil, and though, woe to those who call evil good. See, this is the problem that we're faced with. We have, unfortunately, this thing inside of us that says, hey, you are living a good life. You, that's all God wants for you. God just wants you all to be happy he just wants you guys to have everything that you want. No. You want to know what God wants? He wants you to be in, in, under His authority. That is the whole truth of the Word of God. Look at Paul. He is willingly saying, my life means nothing anymore. I am placing myself underneath submission to God. People who ask what it means to be sold out for Christ, it's this. Giving myself completely over to God's authority in my life. Now, are we going to get it right every every single time? No. So that means we should beat ourselves up when we get it wrong, right? No. But do we? Yes. Why? Because we haven't learned, because we haven't made it to, to chapter 7 yet. But we'll get there, I promise. <laughs> I have, now listen to me, I have you. I have no place and no right to decide what is right or wrong. Not only for me, but others as well. Oh, sister so-and-so said that that's terrible. I have no place to judge her. Matthew 7, 1 says what? Don't judge sometimes. Don't judge. There's no sometimes ever, right? Don't judge. It's not our place. If we are under God's authority, then we will do what he says. Now listen to me. That's what the marriage is. A lot of people say, oh, the man is the head of the household. Guess what? No, he ain't. Amen. The man, amen. God is the head of the household. Amen. Then the man is underneath God. The man is underneath God. Then the woman is underneath the man. But now listen. The woman places herself in subjection to the man because the man is placing himself in subjection to God. Both of them are in subjection to God Almighty. 
They should be a team. They should be a united front. If dad says one thing, what mom says is the same thing as dad. Because God says this is what's right and wrong. See, a lot of times parents say, well, I think, hear me, I think this is a good idea for our kid. And the dad's going, I don't think that's a great idea at all. But mom is basing her thoughts biblically. That's based on what everybody else in the world is doing. Who's right and who's wrong? See, we're starting to, it's not our place to judge. You have to be evenly low. You don't. Now, so this brings us to, yes. Yeah, you have to be full will, but I mean, that's why the search is on this day before you draw it in conclusion. Amen. Mr. Tom can just step right on up here. Because lesson number one of Romans, ready? You need to learn to choose God's authority, not your own opinion. Amen. Choose God's authority, not your own opinion. Listen to me. The world wants to tell you its opinion about everything. Does it? Okay? Who to judge, who not to judge. Who to talk to, who not to talk to. Who to like, who not to like. Who to look at, who not to look at. They want to control everything about you. Why? Because the world is controlled by the enemy. And shouldn't we be surprised? So now, instead of advancing man's agenda, which is what he was doing prior to his Damascus Road experience, now he's preaching the gospel of God. Watch what it says. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart, watch this now, for the gospel of God. Now, as soon as I saw this in my study, I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> so I did a search, and I looked at all of the different places in Scripture where it talks about the gospel of God. Because we want to know, what is the gospel of God? Because now if it's left up to us, one would say, oh, the gospel of God is how you get into eternity. Another will say, oh, the gospel of God is how you're supposed to live your life as a believer. And still another will say, oh, the gospel of God is about what happens after you get into eternity. Who's right? Everybody. This is what we need to understand about the gospel of God. It is the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. Amen. Now the kingdom is the kingdom that is coming. Understand there is a time where Jesus will set his foot down on the Mount of Olives. It's going to be split in half. He's going to be king because he deserves to be king. But now watch this. Go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 verse 14. The, the term, the gospel of God, is mentioned eight different times in the New Testament. When you look at find those words that are together, they are found eight times. Verse 14 of Mark chapter 1. My house rules are in effect. Thank you, because I need water. Yeah. Yeah. I love my son. Floyd, I love you. Verse 14, here we go. And after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching what? Okay, no, what was Jesus preaching? I'm so glad that you asked. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. That's left. <coughs> Bible grill. There it is. Bible Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. So what was it that Jesus was preaching? You ready? What was the very first thing that Jesus preached when he came out of the wilderness? This. Ready? From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I need you to understand something. And a lot of you know this. Some of you may not. Jesus was not preaching to the Gentiles. He was only preaching to the Israelites. Why? Because they were the ones who were supposed to receive the promise. Abraham had two promises. One was spiritual. One was physical. Physical was the land which God gave him. The spiritual portion was to rule and reign with God. But 
they rejected it. What did they do? They ended up killing him. And what did Jesus say? He's telling them, repent. Turn away from your selfish ways, from your traditions, and turn back to God. Because the kingdom of heaven is right here in front of you. If you will believe, if you'll turn around, then the kingdom of heaven will literally begin here. My thousand year reign will begin here. Now, side note, in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, we are called to proclaim all that Christ has taught us. So what are you supposed to be teaching? The gospel of God. Now listen, I don't think I know all of the gospel of God. I'm glad you're here, because that's exactly what Paul's going to do. He will lay it out piece by piece. It's a huge puzzle that he puts together. A lot of the questions that we have about why do I struggle with sin? Why do I struggle with that? How can I not overcome this? What happens when this happens? Is there a such thing as judgment for a believer? All of those things Paul addresses in the books of the book of Romans. All of them. Okay? Now, we therefore are now connected to Paul. Go back to Romans chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, ready? Set apart for the gospel of God. What is your job? What's your job? Spread the gospel. Spread the gospel. Huh? Spread the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now listen to me. Your job is not the nine to five that you go to, right. or the five to whatever or overnight. Whatever. Those are crazy hours. Four minutes, Roxanne. Love her to death. Uh, understand. Your job is not what you do for a living. Your job is to be a bond servant of Christ. Your job is to willingly place yourself under his authority. But listen to me. God ain't a taskmaster that makes a bunch of robots now, is he? No, no. He is letting you choose who you serve. You're going to serve one or two people in this world. Amen. Either yourself, which is connected to the enemy, or you're going to serve God. See, now here's the thing, because now the hush comes. Oh, man, there's a lot of times in my life where I serve myself. It's okay. What? It's, it's okay. Meaning, God knows your weakness. God knows you're not perfect. And he's made a way for you to come back to him any time that you fail. Amen. Amen. That's an awesome God! Amen. When, when I make a mistake, I can literally come back to him and he'll say, you're forgiven. Let's, 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 let's keep going. Amen. He doesn't want you to sit down on the ground and, and, and have a pity party. Because the pity party is for one person and one person only you. Right. And ain't nobody else want to come to it. Uh -huh. Pastor. Yes? That comes strictly from the renewing of your mind. That's exactly right. Yeah. Which Paul is going to talk about. So understand, he does this a lot. Uh, he's been here on Tuesday and Thursday night. Let's look at verses 2 and 3. Now watch this. Which he, God, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In other words, Christ coming, the gospel of God, it ain't something new. There was a mystery attached, with Paul, which Paul is going to talk about. Because most of the Israelites didn't understand that along with ruling and reigning in the kingdom, there were... Rewards. Re what? Rewards. There's an inheritance. There's more to just Jesus tapping you on the shoulder and saying, good job, buddy. There's more to it. But they never saw that. They didn't understand that. So now watch this. God's promise is twofold. Let me bring this out first. His promise in the gospel of God is twofold. It's eternal and millennial. Where do you get that cockamamie idea? Because of the description that Paul gives us about Christ. Now listen to me. Remember one of the greatest questions that you can ask yourself when you're reading scripture? Why? It's okay to ask God why. We got that? Because when you ask God why, first of all, you're responding to the Holy Spirit who's telling you, psst, there's something there. And when you read it, you say why. Now watch, look at verse, look at verse 4. Who was Jesus, who was declared the Son of God by the power of resurrection? Verse 3, they will come back. Concerning his Son, who was born of a descendant of David. Why throw David in there? Who is David? 
David was a king. So now God made a promise to David and said, hey, guess what? I'm going to have somebody come from your lineage that will rule forever. Now, listen to me. There came a time after the book of Malachi and the Israelites were in exile. There was no king. See, God took back what he gave them because they wanted a king. They wanted a king. Now, watch this. Like everybody else. That's the trip. That's that. That's the trap. That's the trap of the Christian life. To be like everybody else, y'all. Just look around you. How many churches? Not dog in churches. How many churches are just like everybody? <clears throat> hey, we want to do what they're doing. They got what? and smoke machines and all kinds of stuff. Y'all all would pass out with all that smoke in some of those places. Now watch this. So now watch. There's a twofold promise, Abraham and David. right? In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, when it talks about the genealogy of Christ, it says Abraham and David. Why? Because David was a king. Abraham was the one who believed by faith and was saved. So now what is Paul doing? He's laying something out for you. He's trying to tell you that Jesus Christ in his coming was here for not just to get you into heaven. We need to catch on to that. And others need to hear this. Look at me. Jesus did not come to the earth just to get you into heaven. He literally wants to live his life through you. What? Paul talks about it. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 7. It's all there. It's all laid out. Now watch this. Jesus is a descendant of David. This points to Christ's kingship. Okay? So he's a descendant of David. It points to the fact that he's a king. It's his kingship. But, verse 4 says, he is declared the Son of God by power by the resurrection from the dead. How many of y'all died this week and came back from the dead? <laughs> now you felt like you no, you literally died and came back from the dead, right? None of you. Why? Because that's something that only God can do. It shows Jesus' eternal nature. So now when you put the two of them together, what is a king? A king is a man who sits on a throne. But now we've got Christ who is eternal. So now what is Paul saying? Y'all, Jesus is fully man and fully God. Jesus is fully man and fully God. Anybody who tries to tell you otherwise, bring them to this passage. Because now listen to me. Hear, hear this. This is the beginning of the gospel of God. It all begins with the Word. Who was the Word? Jesus is the Word. He's always been the Word. Amen. And the Word came and tabernacled with us. Whoo, y'all. That's the gospel that people need to hear. You ready? And you and I have been called to proclaim it. You and I have been called to proclaim the gospel of God. Not just to get them into heaven. How to live the life now that you're saved. And then what's coming afterwards. That's the gospel of God. That's what you've been called to proclaim. Right. I've never been to seminary. Don't care. You don't need seminary. Right. Yes, that's exactly. You know what you need? This. Amen. This is all you need. Scripture interprets scripture. The context determines the meaning. If you follow those two rules, you will never go wrong. Amen. I don't care what everybody else says. You have to have a degree. You have to have this. You have to, no, you don't. You need this. You need the Word of God, and that's it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Remember we talked about the Greek parentheses a few weeks ago when we talked about John, the love, and the love, and in between? There's actually a Greek parentheses here because in the beginning, he talks about the gospel, and at the end of Romans, chapter 16, he talks about my gospel. That's crazy. Give me a favor for just a second. Turn to the very end of Romans, Romans chapter 16, verse 25. 
Romans 16, verse 25. And in these words, this will blow your mind. Ready? Now, to him, God, who is able to establish you. Now, listen to me. You are not supposed to be the one establishing yourself. You are supposed to live by grace through faith. Now watch this. You, according to my gospel. Listen to me. You ready? This is my beloved. What does that mean? That means that I care deeply about her. I care deeply about what happens to her. Think about what you call as yours. This is my car. This is my house. What is he implying? It's something personal. Now watch what he says here. He's literally saying that the gospel of God is so personal to him, he doesn't want to live without it. Amen. That is what we are called to do. And listen to me. I don't care what the enemy tries to tell you. That's exactly where you are right now. You are at a point in your life, or else you wouldn't be here, that you want more than anything to know more about God, to know more about His Word, to know Him more. See, when we know God more, when we're more intimate with God, He shares Himself more. Because that's what a good relationship is all about. Amen. It's all about love. It's all about the other person. So now watch. The whole gospel is not merely a word... It is a lifestyle. Okay, now listen. When Paul starts dropping this, I need you to understand this. Because a lot of people will say, oh, just go out and preach the word. Just go out and tell them about Jesus. That's not what the gospel of God is about. The gospel of God is not just about, Jesus gets you into heaven. Bye. The gospel of God is literally a lifestyle that you live. Jesus didn't come and die for you to know a doctrine. Jesus didn't come and die just so you can have a notch in your category of understanding saying, oh, I know this. Jesus came and died so that he would live for you, Amen. through you, Amen. for others. Remember the whole point about fruit? Amen. Who's the fruit for? Not the, front, not the branch. It's for other people. Amen. And we strain. I try to make fruit. Try to make, you ain't got to try to make fruit. It just... Comes out. And it's for somebody else. That's what the gospel of God is about. Listen, when I said earlier, when the Lord called me to pray for freedom and liberty, what he's telling us right now is, look, this gospel has the ability to set you free from the torment of your mind. Anybody have that problem when they're praying? Ooh, lots of hands. Why? Because the flesh hates the fact that you are new. Amen. The flesh wants everything it can to survive, and it will do anything that it can to survive. And we'll talk about that too. Now let's go to verse 4. Now we talk about the gospel of God is not just a word, it's not just a doctrine, it's a lifestyle. How do we know that? Because of what we read in verse 4. Who, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead? According to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our what? What if I told you that the whole point of your Christian life was to learn what it means to have Christ as Lord of your life? What does that mean? Go back to verse 1. It is a person who willfully places themselves in submission to God. He uses this word Lord. Why? Remember, great question to ask. Why does he say Lord? Because Lord is the Greek word kurios, which means supreme in authority, a master, a controller. Mm. Some of us have a problem with authority. Mm. You do not, Roger, stop. <laughs> you listen to your beloved all the time. No, I'm just kidding. Now watch this. Christ calls you to put yourself underneath his authority. So that means that anything that he says goes. When he says forgive, you don't even, you just forgive. Why? He forgave me. 
God says, Jesus says, love. Serve one another with love. Meaning, out of the Spirit, serve. Someone who's under that authority, they're going to do that. Now listen to me. Go back to the beginning. Are you going to do that every single time? No. No. Nope. You're going to fail. But guess what? Remember, we talked about taking little baby steps. You're still headed in the right direction. <coughs> it's the person you... Now listen to me. What, what are you beginning to see? There's a choice here. Yeah. There's a choice that I have to make. Will I choose to be in control and say, this is right and this is wrong? Or will I hear from the Lord when he says, this is the right way? Now walk in it. Remember, we talk about faith without works, right? That's the whole point. The word of God tells you something and you respond. You don't ask questions, you just do it. Amen. Right? Watch this. Here we go. Tough question to ask. Everybody ready? Is Christ incomplete and total control of my life. Listen to me. For me, just throw myself out there. Not 24-7, y'all. I would love to tell you that I'm the superficial guy. Uh, 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 I struggle, y'all. Just like you. There, there is no difference. We are all in the same boat. God may tell me to take the helm, but that doesn't mean that I don't know where I'm going sometimes. Understand, we are all in that same boat. Or do we go about our daily lives judging what is right and wrong based on what we want to happen? Ah! So now we get a little bit of an understanding of what it's about. Understand that the flesh is conniving. It can make the immoral seem moral. Huh? It can make the unrighteous seem righteous. See, it's tricky that way. Here, spoiler alert, that's not who you are. Amen. You are a moral, righteous, holy saint. Pope never called me a saint. <laughs> really? One of the, the greatest freeing times of my life, we're going to get to it. One of the greatest freeing times of my life was to understand when, when I first got saved, somebody said, hey, you're now a saint. What? Now, I grew up Catholic. Okay? And as, as a Catholic, and some of you all understand this, that saints are only called saints by some dude who sits in some place somewhere and says, Thus thou art saintest. <laughs> but that's not, what does God's word say? We're going to get there. All right, come on, let's go. Let's look at verse 5. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the... Oh, good. The uh, 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 <laughs> obedience of faith. Come on now, because we have to understand it. We are called to live in obedience. Now, what is obedience? Submission and compliance. You see what Paul's doing? You see what he's done? He calls himself a bondservant. I will fully place myself under God's authority. And then he turns the tables on you and says, guess what? He's Jesus Christ our Lord, meaning everybody together. And as he's our Lord, we should be in submission to him. And now he says, we need to bring about the obedience of faith. What is the obedience? It's the submission or the compliance of what? Of faith. What is faith? Hearing the word of God and making choices according to that word. Guess what? Paul will talk about that too. Man, you'd think he pretty much knew what he was doing, huh? Pretty much. Because God gave him a word, not just for the people of Rome and the surrounding areas, for us. Y'all, he's given us a word on how to live the life. Thank you. I knew it was coming. I was just waiting for you. Faith is a surrender to the one who asks us to trust him. You see, that's God's whole thing with us. All he wants you to do is trust him. And if I trust him, I love him. If I love him, I'm going to obey him. Remember, we went through that a few weeks ago, too. So that is God's call. To surrender is to obey. What am I surrendering? Your wants. Your desires. Your dreams. Your hopes. Your judgments. Of what I deem what is right and wrong. If God says it's wrong... I don't care 
with the rest of society says it's wrong. If God has called it a sin, it is a sin. Does that separate a person who is saved eternally? No. That means they have an opportunity to come back, though. Amen. Key. So key. What else am I surrendering? My control. You have to give up your control. You have to give up your control. Now listen, that's where the flesh digs in. He wants to be in control. And every single one of you have been to that point where the flesh has dug his heels in and said, uh-uh, I'm doing this thing because I've always done this thing. Don't care if it's immoral, but I'm doing it because I want to do it. And you're going to follow along with me. Mm. But inside, you are screaming in your spirit going, no, no, no. Paul will address the whole problem. There is freedom. Listen, you ready for this? Shocker. You don't have to listen to the flesh. Amen. Even more so, yes. you don't have to obey the flesh. Sure. That is freedom, folks. Yes. I don't have to obey what he says to do, but I've always done it that way. Aha! But you're a new person. You are brand new. How do I know that? Because in Romans chapter 6, Paul, God, is literally going to tell you the old you who used to be is dead. D-E-A-D, -E dead. What does that mean? If I'm dead, I have no breath. But he brought you back to life. So remember earlier when I said anybody died this week? You may have died a long time ago when you accepted Christ. Spiritually. Now let's look at verses 6 and 7. Among whom you also yes. are the call... What did I miss? Yes. We, are called we are called to die daily. Yes! <laughs> Alright? Among whom... Now watch this. Now he turns and makes it personal. Why do you got to make it personal? Because God loves you. Okay? And he wants to personally talk to you this morning, to this afternoon. Right? Now watch. Among whom you also... That's you... Everybody say me. me. Are the called of Jesus Christ. And to all who are the beloved of God in Rome, called as... <coughs> ah, see? Gotcha. You're a saint. Don't care what you say. Verse 6. First thing he says is you are called. What does it mean to be called? To be called means that you are saved. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. Jude, verse 1. You will see that he's talking to believers. A believer is someone who is called. Matthew twenty two fourteen. 14. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are saved, but few are called out of the call because they have lived a faithful life. It doesn't mean they lost their salvation because you're still called. And if I'm called, there's this other word that's attached to it. He says something that I call my Miss Darlene. I think some of us need to catch this one more than anything. To understand how much you are loved by God. This word beloved is literally an adjective. And the best way that I could put down the description was... The one that love, loves. Because it's connected to the verb of loving. Right? So God loves you in such a way that you are his beloved. But not Tuesday. When I went off on that guy? <coughs> nope. Do you think, honestly, that the God of the universe is moved because you make a mistake and he says, I can't love them right now. If you do, we have a warped sense of God's love. God's love is unconditional. Now what else does that tell you? There is nothing that you can do to prove to God that you should be loved. Oh, I need to say that again. There is nothing that you need to do to prove to God that you deserve His love. Amen. We don't deserve anything. Amen. But when Christ died on the cross and 
we said, I believe, that changed everything. The cross is the demarcation of the world right there. And once you accept in his son, that's it. Game over. You are his beloved. He loves you forever. Huh? I said you love unconditionally. Because otherwise you'd be saying God loves you, but sometimes he doesn't like you. And that's not right either. What were you going to say? Beforehand. So the mistake that you're going to make this week, he already knows. And he hadn't dropped you off the face of the earth right now, right? Everybody breathing? Right? Now listen to me. Oh, now watch. What have we been? What, what have we been taught in our raising? If you, young man, do this, then mm, I don't think you really love me. That was that was told to me. I was a kid. You did this thing, I don't think you really loved me. That tore me to pieces. Because now I framed my idea of God based on that conversation. The only way that I can prove that I'm worthy enough for God to love me is to do things right all the time. Can I get a little love? But that's not it. Listen to me. There's freedom there. There's freedom in understanding that God loves you regardless. It doesn't, listen to me, you may have hang-ups, you may have problems, you may have issues, you may make mistakes, but God still loves you. The problem is, when we make the mistake and we decide, listen to me, we decide, I have to stay in this place. I have to punish myself. I want to tell you something. When you make a mistake and you punish yourself, that literally breaks God's heart. Because what you're telling Him is, your love is not good enough. Here we go. You are called, you are saved. You are a beloved, but not only that, you are a saint. Now watch this. The word saint means one who is separate and holy. You have been separated. Listen to me. The Bible says that God has transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His Son, Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. My former teacher, Ms. Cunningham, gave me a great joke. How many disciples does it take to change the light bulb? Well, no! Jesus is the light of the world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to ask her one okay. Okay. So God transferred you into a kingdom of light. Listen to me. Transfer is to take from one and to put into the other. Listen, to never go back. It doesn't matter what you do. You can't go back. When you are in, the door closes behind you and it disappears. You can't go out. Now, you can sit down in the lobby and decide that's where I want to stay. But that's not what God's will is for you. But now, now, now watch what Paul has done. See, he called and he is, because he was a wonderful writer. He literally said, I'm a bond servant. I'm called out. I'm called into obedience to Christ. So are you. I've been given this gospel. This gospel about grace, how to live by grace, and then what comes afterwards. So have you. I have been called out by God, and I've been separated by God for this very purpose. So have you. You say thank you, Lord. Listen to me. For me, I'm not worthy of all. And that's the lie of the flesh. Yes. Because the fact that we're not worthy, it's only because of Christ that we're worthy to come to the flood. That's exactly right. Because our, 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 our righteousness is not ours, it's God's. Amen. We have none. How can I be holy? Well, Don't right. Don't be holy. Not by what you are, but what is within you. And what you've been placed into. Remember the water? If the water is holy water, and you've been placed into the holy water, guess what you are? You're holy. God no longer sees who you used to be. He sees who are you are going to be. Oh, if we wouldn't treat each other like that. You're right. There are religions that say that only certain people can be saints based on the decision that a man makes. And that is a lie from the enemy because now what am I trying to do? I'm trying to prove to God that I'm worthy enough to be a saint. But I'm already beloved. Listen to me. If 
we just sit here beloved, that would be enough for me. The one who loved, loves. You are beloved of God. And now, watch the linchpin to all of this. Verse 7. This is the part that we struggle with the most. I promise you. Verse 7. To all who are the beloved of God in Rome, call the saints. Ready? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the what? Where is your peace? It's been a it's been a nasty two years in this country, in this world. I want you to understand what is grace. We've talked about this a few times. Grace, God's ability for my inability. It is literally God doing something on my behalf. There is nothing that I could have done to save myself, right? Is there any prayer that I could pray? Any steps that I could kneel up? Like 150 of them or whatever? There's nothing that I can do, right? What could I do to gain eternal life? Accept the invitation that Christ has already died on the cross for me. He's my substitute. Okay? Once I believe that, now I have eternal life. What takes that away from me? Nothing can take you away from that. Because nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Once you're there, you're there. Don't care what happens in your life. Don't care what happens. People will say, oh, but if they live this way, then nah, your salvation is all about works now, isn't it? But you are saved by grace, by God's dying on the cross for you. Because you were unable to fulfill it. There's no way you could have been good enough. All man is tainted. In, in Genesis chapter 3, Satan thought he won. He thought he was good to go. But God said, uh-uh. Now watch. Grace. So now watch. How are you called to live? You are called to live by that very same grace. That means he's in charge. Oh, you mean like the Lord of my life? Bingo. That's what grace is. Allowing God to live. How do I do that? Hang on. Paul's going to tell us exactly how to do that. And it's a lot easier than you think. But here's the last one. Peace. Listen, this is the one thing that I hear most people struggle with. I need peace. I have no peace in my life, Pastor. I have no peace. I need God to give me peace. Peace is a sense of rest and contentment. Now, I need you to see something. Grace to you and peace. What's that next word? From God. Everybody see it? Peace from God. Listen to me. It does not say peace with God. As he's going to talk about in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Why? Because peace with God comes when an unbeliever becomes saved. Now they have peace with God. I am at peace with God. I am no longer at enmity with Him. But, but, as I have peace with God, what does that mean? That, that means that now I can have the peace that is from God. Listen to me. That's the one thing that most people want. Now, here's the thing. That word from literally means out of. The peace that comes out of God. And what Paul is saying is he wants you, you, not just the Romans. Y'all need to make this personal. He wants you to live by grace. Meaning God is in control. He is the one who makes the choices for you. But he also wants you to live by God's peace. And this is what we say. I need God to give me peace. And I asked him that once. And you know what he said to me? Nope. But God, I need peace. I need your peace. And he said, nope. But God, what, can I have peace? With, what do I have to do? Gerald, how can you ask me for something you already have? The Spirit is love, joy, peace. Listen, stop asking God for peace. You already have it. 
Stop asking God for grace. You already have it. It's already yours. But what happens? The flesh says, you have no peace. Your bills are a mess. Your life is a mess. Your car broke down. This, that, and the other thing. You're this, that, all these things that we that are issues in our life, right? And the flesh tags onto that and says, oh, you must not be living right. <laughs> We know full well every single reason why we have a test, a trial, or a temptation to make. The only thing is to encourage your faith and to make you stronger. Because right. you have a choice. You have a choice. Now, if we could take these, these first seven verses and narrow it down to one statement, we would have a focus for Paul's introduction. Because what we just read, verses 1 through 7, is, is his introduction. What is he trying to tell us? You will have the peace of God. You will have the grace of God. Listen to me. That is due to you as a beloved of God when you live in obedience to his authority. Stop deciding what's right and wrong based on what you think is right and wrong. Start living associated to God's authority. But listen to me. If you're struggling with a choice about something, I'm going to tell you this. Go to the Word of God and find the answer. <laughs> because it's there. Um, well, this one may not be. Oh, it's there. I promise you. Right? Everybody knows that. Yes. Little things going to come again. God will test your faith. But the thing is, it's, it's, it's coming against you because of hate he has Christ. Right. And the Bible says they're going to hate you because of that. So you need to learn to walk in authority in Christ's name and get right. right. back to God so he can deal with you. Yeah. Now watch this. Well, this. So now let's 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 take this in. Obedience to God's authority. Paul displayed it. He said, I'm a bouncer. Jesus illustrated it. When Jesus came to the earth, what did he say? I came to do the will of my Father. Okay. Oh, Jesus, aren't you here to do your will? No, I'm here to do the will of my Father. Why? Because Jesus' will and the Father's will were one. They were intrinsically linked. Guess what? So should yours be. It is for man's own good. Those who are unbelievers, they need to understand the obedience of faith. It's not just about you getting your life, your fire insurance, folks. Right. Not, it brings God's glo God glory. Verse 5, it says, it's for His name's sake. You living in obedience to God's authority gives, God's, gives God glory. Amen. Amen. Last thing, it's our call to we are called to live in this obedience. Now listen to me. Don't see obedience as a hard task, Pastor. Because what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, about a yoke that he wanted to put on? Is it hard? It's gentle. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. Y'all? Your spirit is already at rest. You understand that? Bingo! There it is! The peace you already have! So now what, what do we need to do? We need to live the peace of God out through our lives. We need to let God do that to us. That's the whole point of Romans. Now, he's going to go back. What's that? I said, do that peace is real. Thank you. It leads to everything. So now, in verse 8, for the rest of Romans, He's going to literally break apart for each and every one of us how an unbeliever becomes a believer, how you, after you accepted Christ, are now supposed to live as a beloved and as someone who's supposed to live by grace, to live in obedience, but to live in a life of peace. Oh, that we could live a life of peace, right? He's going to lay that out too, but he's also going to talk to you about this thing that's going to happen. Judgment. Because you have a choice to live this life. God did not make a little bunch of robots. You have a choice. And then he's going to talk about the possibility for you to have a reward. 
And then at the very end, he's going to lock it in. Because listen to me. If you stick with us, and the Lord allows us to go through Romans together, when we get to the end, we will literally call the gospel of God the gospel. And it will be so personal to you. And you will share it with everybody that you come in contact with. Yes? The thing is, we can't do it on ourselves. None of us are capable. Without Christ, none of us are capable. And now we have to get to that point. Remember when we talked about desperation and death? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, because that's where we're going. God is the master author of all of this. He put all of this together. This, is, this isn't catching up. Right. So now here is my call to each and every one of you and to myself. Will we decide to be bondservants of the Lord Jesus Christ? To place ourselves underneath His obedience, His authority. And to do what He wants to do. To choose for Him to live through us. We need to make the decision for Him to be in control. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank You for the power of Your Word. I thank you for the fact that in these first seven verses, Paul, who is a brother of ours, literally calls himself a bondservant, one that is set apart and one that has been set apart for a gospel message. Not just, the, not just grace into heaven, but for the believer as well. But then for afterwards, this gospel, which he calls my gospel. And Lord God, from this point forward, he is going to share, you, Lord, are going to share this with us. To show us step by step what it means. And Lord God, at this point, we have a decision to make. Our decision is to, will we or will we not place ourselves under your authority? I'm going to be honest with you, Dad. That's hard. It's a rough choice. But I know that nothing good comes from what I decide to choose right and wrong. Mm. It's only from your authority. It's only from what you say is true. So Father, for myself, I choose you. I choose to place myself underneath your authority. Brothers and sisters, what will you choose this moment? Listen, we don't, we don't have later. We have right now. And God's eyes, God's heart, knows exactly what you're going to say. And he loves you. And I thank you, Father, for the decisions that are being made right now, for the hearts that are surrendering over to you, for the glory that you're getting, because you are doing amazing things right now. I thank you and I praise you, Father. May you receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, because from this point forward, we are set apart for you. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that I pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.